When it comes to the different characters we see all throughout the JoJo universe, there is one who stands out as the most influential that not many people give credit to, mostly because it wasn't just him playing the antagonist role, but three of them. The Pillar Men are easily some of the most memorable, but least discussed villains in the entire JoJo series, somewhat understandably so, as their relevance only pertains to one part in the series, even in spite of how popular that part is, and how influential they were on the universe as a whole. So let's take a look at one of the few villains that actually succeeded in their goals, and how they might have actually actually succeeded before the events that took place at the end of the part. Before we start, I'm going to give a quick spoiler warning for parts 1, 2, and technically 3, I guess, if you want to count the first couple episodes where they explain what a stand is. Anyways, part 2 is one of the most beloved parts among the fans, so it would also make sense that the main antagonist of the part would also be held in a special place among the fan base, and that special place is usually regarded as, yeah, they're pretty cool, and they have the best theme. But bro, who'd win, Dio or the boss? As I mentioned previously, Obviously, they're loved and respected, but for the most part, they're kind of forgotten about since there's little to no mention of them outside of their own part. And also, based on how drastically the series changed from part 3 onwards with the introduction of stands. But if you think about it, none of that would be possible without the Pillar Men. Let's look at it from an in-universe point of view. The Pillar Men, or rather Cars specifically, was responsible for the creation of vampires. Cars, originating from a group that would later be called the Pillar Men, that's gonna be annoying, wanted more. The Pillar Pillar men were forced to live underground, but cars thought that had it not been for a specific weakness, they could easily rule over all of life on Earth. This drove him to develop a way for pillar men to unlock their full potential. This ambition led to the creation of the stone masks that unlocks a wearer's potential through acupuncture. Though the normal stone mask wasn't strong enough to unlock the full potential of the pillar men, only unlocking some of their potential, it did work quite well on humans. And I'm sure you can see where I'm going with this. With eventually Dio obtaining the stone mask and using it to become a vampire, had it not been for these stone masks, Dio wouldn't have been able to become a vampire. And that alone changes the entire series. For example, with Dio not being a vampire, he wouldn't have been able to live long enough to travel to Egypt and obtain a stand, which results in the entire Joestar bloodline not receiving a stand. And from there, you can imagine how vastly different the entire JoJo universe would be. Outside of the changes that would happen in-universe, the Pillar Men also marked the end of Hamon. After part 2 and going into part 3, we saw a transition of Hamon to stand. Though stands are kind of framed as an evolution of Hamon, a spirit Hamon of sorts, nonetheless, we see very little usage of Hamon past part 2. Many fans say that Hamon should have still been present in the series to some degree, and even some of the crazier takes being that Araki should have just continued with the power system and not introduced stands. I'm not joking, I've genuinely heard that before. From a fan service perspective, I somewhat agree, as I always got hyped when I would see Joseph use Hamon in some way during the later parts. But if you really do stop to think about it, there was nowhere else to go with Hamon. What do I mean by that? Well, it's not so much that there were just no new ways to make Hamon cool or unique, as it holds a lot of potential, but it kind of fulfilled its purpose. Hamon was developed as a way for humanity to level the playing field against the Pillar Men. That also came with being able to defend themselves from being spawned from the creation of the stone masks, like vampires or zombies. After part 2, you can reasonably assume that the rest of the stone masks, or a majority of them, have been destroyed thanks to the Speedwagon foundation. Because of that, there is no longer a looming threat of new vampires entering the world, and by extension, new zombies. That, on top of the fact that the remaining Pillar Men have been defeated, Hamon has successfully done what it was created to do. As cool as it would have been to see other characters use it, it's just no longer needed. But Part 2 didn't just let it fizzle out, it was able to take Hamon out with an absolute bang, showcasing to us just how powerful it can be thanks to Ultimate Lifeform Cars being able to use an ultimate version of it, showing us Hamon at its absolute peak, before later explaining that Hermit Purple is just a Stan manifested version of Hamon, gracefully transitioning us from Hamon to Stans. Without the Pillar Men, we wouldn't have had the satisfying conclusion of Hamon, which allowed for Stans to make their way into the spotlight. Now that we have a good understanding of how important both in-universe and out-of-universe the Pillar Men are to the series, let's actually take a look at them. I think collectively, JoJo fans can agree that Cars, ACDC, and Wamu had one of the, if not the best introduction for a villain. It's a very very iconic scene, and the Pillar Men theme is one of the most recognizable in the series. Moving on, Kars, ACDC, and Wamu's main objective is to obtain the Redstone of Asia, and combine it with a special version of the Stone Mask so they can become the ultimate life forms. Kars does end up achieving this goal, and gains unparalleled power just like in his plan, yet he loses. Despite now being the ultimate life form, he still got outplayed by Joseph because of his need to revel in his superiority. So even though Kars is technically stronger, he 
in a way became weaker. Now, this is a part where you say, oh, so you're going to say that Cars got weaker because he has more of an ego now. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that Cars achieving what he thought to be perfection by becoming the ultimate life form made him weaker because he was already perfect. Or rather, they were already perfect. The Pillarmen that we come to know were a group made up of four Pillarmen. Cars, ACDC, Wamu, and Santana. We're going to exclude Santana as he's not really important and even disregarded as a guard dog by Cars. So Cars, ACDC, Wamu are the main three Pillarmen that our group trains to be able to fight against. Cars' main power being light, ACDC using heat, and Wamu controlling wind. Individually, they are a force to be reckoned with, all of them presenting great feats, and only being defeated by having their weaknesses be taken advantage of. Together though, they're unstoppable. To understand what I mean, let's first take a look at Wamu. Wamu is a very honorable fighter. He respects those who are strong and take their fight seriously. Not serious in the sense of not joking, more so in a sense that his opponent is giving their all to defeat him. Fighting is his life, and therefore that's how he approaches situations, even changing the trio's initial plans so he may pursue battles. However, he is also not distracted by fighting. He himself would like to pursue battle, but if Cars or ACDC did not allow for it, Wamu would have this idea of not being distracted is also demonstrated in his actual fights as well. For example, to help further focus on the fight at hand, he'll proceed to jab his own eyes, entering a state of extreme focus and relying on his form. Car is even stating he's psychologically invincible in this state, being able to see air better than light. Wamu is the spirit of the group. He is the might that forges the path to achieving their goals. On his own, his desire for battle and his ego can be exploited, but as part of the trio, Cars and ACDC are able to keep him in check. With Wamu being the spirit in the might, ACDC would be the mind in the strategy. ACDC is a very strategic fighter, coming up with intricate plans and able to outright read his opponent in what they might be planning. His weakness is himself. Joseph and ACDC are very similar in both fighting style and mindset. They are both individuals who read the opponent and use it against them. So when ACDC became unreadable to Joseph and was able to read Joseph's plans, it caught Joseph off guard and made him vulnerable. The difference between them and why Joseph ended up coming out on top is because he planned around his emotions getting read. ACDC did no such thing. He thought he was able to clearly read his opponent and that he himself was unreadable, so he felt that there was no need to plan for a situation where he gets outplayed because of his confidence in his abilities. It's not as if ACDC lost because he was stupid or not as smart as Joseph, he lost because he essentially fought a mirrored version of himself, but his alternate self wasn't over-reliant on his abilities to read the opponent and not be read by the opponent. Even still, after his defeat, he was able to trick Joseph into thinking he was dead, which allowed him to send the stone off to Switzerland. His plan was to get the stone to the other Pillarmen, and that's what he did. Had it not been for Lisa Lisa using Hamon to find the location of where he sent the stone, it's possible that the Pillarmen would have gotten to the stone first. Then finally, we have Cars, the will of the group, and the one who tied together the brains and the bronze. Cars, being the leader and the one who started their journey with the creation of the stone masks, sought to rule over all life on Earth. With ACDC and later Wamu joining him, the three sought out the Redstone of Asia so they can become the ultimate life forms and together fulfill Kars' goal of ruling over Earth. Though Kars does achieve his goal of becoming the ultimate life form, his rule over Earth never began as he was defeated shortly after. Together, the three of them embody spirit, mind, and will, and were the ultimate life forms with no competition. Before the series even started, they already wiped out the clan of Hamon users who were protecting the stone, proving that together they were already more superior than anyone in their way. Before then, hibernating under the Colosseum and then picking back up where they left off. Their goal was to become the ultimate life forms through the use of the stone mask, not knowing they already achieved that goal, but together rather than as individuals. Also, so they wouldn't be weak to the sun, but that's every JoJo fan's weakness. Thank you so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed. If you did, leave a like and subscribe if you want to see more stuff like this. Also, follow my Twitter. It's the easiest way to keep up with whatever I got going on. Also, also, I live stream both on this channel and my Twitch channel pretty frequently, so if you see me live, hop in chat, say hi. I'd love to have you. Anyways, I want to give a quick shout out to G, as always. It's funny because in the Diablo video, I talked about how I wasn't sure what to talk about when it came to Diablo, but then we had a two-hour conversation about it, but genuinely when it came to the Pillarmen, I didn't think there was anything I could really make a video about until G pulled something out of his ass about Pokemon and it just spiraled from there. So thanks G. Anyways, that's pretty much it. Thank you so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed. If you haven't already, watch the anime, read the manga. I'll see you in the next one.